what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. Um, I'm going to formally introduce you to Guillaume in a second. If you are watching the video, you can see we have Mage Montreal right here, and we're going to be breaking stuff down. And Guillaume is a web expert, among other things. So he's going to be breaking some stuff down. Before we get to it, I like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast and Guillaume has a podcast as well, which is e-commerce wizards podcast. So he's going to say some of his favorite episodes. I'm going to say some of mine. Um, you know, since this is, uh, agency owners, actually, you may be interested in this one, Guillaume, uh, I had Chris Madden on, and he talks about NFTs, the metaverse and what they're doing with NFTs for their agency. Um, and how they're deploying it, releasing it, how they price it and everything like that. Also, uh, Lisa Larson Kelly of Quantius, and she has companies like Shopify and Metaver- Metaverse. I think it's Meta, or it used to be Facebook, whatever it's called now. And uh, we're going to be talking about some Shopify stuff as well. So check those out. Many of you are on Inspired Insider. Guillaume, what are some of your favorites on your podcast? I'm going to pull that up here. Sure. So one of those would be with uh, Derek. Um, Haney here, Adobe Magento versus Shopify. So it's an hour and a half long sort of friendly battle of a Magento expert versus Shopify expert. If you listen to the whole thing, you you really know in that both platforms, especially to pick which one's the right pick for a project. So that's a, a really good one. And under, Before you get uh, to the next one, Guillaume, so what was one of, do you remember, what was one of your major points that he had to concede to? And was there anything that you had to concede to like Shopify is better at this Magento is better at this? Well, if you want to keep it a super simple, high level, the more complex the project is like multi-warehouse, multi-inventory, multi-country, uh, multi-everything, and it's more complex, the more Magento will tend to win hands down. And the more simple the project, the more Shopify will win. And the, the cost to build and upkeep Shopify, Shopify is way lower. So at first, that may surprise people as a Magento expert, I do tell them, validate properly if a SaaS system works for you because the cost will be way lower and it is a good idea to check that first. So that's the point that I do concede like, hey, if a SaaS system like Shopify will do the job for you, well, great, it, w- it will be less expensive. But very often people find the limitations of Shopify eventually and they need to move to a different platform. Uh, sometimes Shopify Plus is enough, but if they need even more personalization and so on capability, it will be a different platform like yeah. Magento or other. Yeah. So you were going to mention another episode. I'm, I'm just scrolling up here. We have Joe Valley of Quiet Light. They have a great podcast too. And uh, check that out. And uh, Jeff Cohen, who uh, was at Seller Labs, now at Amazon, actually. Um, I know all these guys. This is great. Stephen Pope <laughs> is on here. Chris Mercer is on here. Vinny Fisher. Um, and then yeah, this, you said, was a good fun. one too. Yeah, well, they're, they're all good one. Like I'm having fun with all these guys you just named here. Uh, but for sure, uh, Casper of Alumio, very interesting episode here because this guy built an agency to over 55 employees. Uh, very uh, nice exit for him and so on. He was also an e-commerce only agency just doing Magento. And he they built their own IP intellectual property of Alumio, which is an integration platform, uh, low code, no code, and so on. And he sold his agency and transitioned to that uh, product business after. So there's a lot to learn, even for agency owners, about like risk management, project management, increasing agency profitability, and so on. So this is a, a fun one. Uh, lots of value, I believe, if you listen to all of it. This is great. So this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. How do we do that? We help you run your podcast. You know, Guillaume, you've known me long enough. I think the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and the companies I most admire and feature them on my podcast and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. You can email us anytime at support at rise25.com. And listen, 
If a business wants a powerful e-commerce online store that will increase their sales, um, I know, Guillaume, people have uh, piled up, they have to move piled up dormant inventory to free up cash reserves, or they want to automate business processes to gain efficiency and reduce the human processing errors. Well, guess what? You're in luck. That's what Mage Montreal does. Guillaume Letoile has been helping e-commerce stores for over a decade. And the catch is they're specialized and they only work on Adobe Magento e-commerce platform. So if you want Shopify, it's a no-go. You got to have Magento e-commerce platform. And they're among only a handful of certified actual Adobe Magento companies in Canada. So um, you can check them out uh, at magemontreal.com, as you can see right here. And you can check their podcast out, uh, e-commerce wizards podcast. So Guillaume, thanks for being with me. Well, thanks for having me. And definitely doing a podcast can say like it expands my mind because I'm meeting all those amazing people. And yeah, it's definitely a plus to run a podcast in this regard. Also an amazing way to outreach people or establish a connection. Like I was meeting some of those amazing CEO and the guys like that big shot guy with 2000 employees. And I'm like, what do I tell to the guy? Like, I don't have a specific question or whatever. So we say, hi, hi. And then, well, it's hard to go anywhere from there. So and say, hey, I'm going to invite him on my podcast. And this way we can start having an additional 30 minute conversation to brainstorm if he says yes, and an additional one hour together. And then I'm starting to build a real relationship with that person. Yeah. And from a professional development <laughs> standpoint, I like to have people on that can teach me something, right? Like you'll learn some amazing stuff from a CEO who runs a 2000 person company, right? So yep. It's just amazing information. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, since you are an expert e-commerce websites, talk about some uh, big mistakes or low-hanging fruit that people should be thinking about. And you mentioned before we hit record here, um, some things you're working on with with push notifications. Oh, yeah. Well, that's... It's a mix of a buzzword and a real thing, I would say, but like yeah, non-fungible tokens you were talking before and, and so on. So it is the PWA, so Progressive Web App. Uh, Adobe's been talking about it since like 2017, but it was more like a beta version prototype stuff. But now it's really coming uh, that all of the uh, major e-commerce platforms say they have a PWA or headless uh, version, which is not exactly the same, but all good enough that basically uh, you have a better technology, sort of a hybrid between a uh, native app and a website. So you get some of the benefits of both. So even though it's a website in terms of maintenance, you don't need to download the latest version of the app. So you like you have on the phone, always outdated. It's a website. So you always have the latest content. It has some offline capabilities, not that much, but it has some of it. So you could browse, for example, pages that you've already browsed, even in offline mode, and it will still work on like a normal website that if you don't have connectivity, it will just give you an error message. And you will also um, have it like overall a faster website. And you will also have push notification for marketing, just like if you had a native app. So that's interesting too. You know, the other thing we were discussing is, you know, what's next? You know, as a technology person, person, you're always looking for what's next in the company, what's next for your clients. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts and what you're thinking of in, uh, in regards to AI. Okay, so well, AI is, is it's step by step. So it's often seen as that magical thing, but it, before it gets magical, you have a lot of groundwork and manual work and data entry and that enrichment to do. So most companies are not even there yet that truly using AI unless it's something out of the box. So it does like its own Magento Commerce and some other places you can have product recommendation. Uh, that's using AI. So the, the machine is learning. Uh, does that suggested product converts yes or no? And if it doesn't, it's going to suggest something else. So Adobe Commerce and Adobe, Sen Adobe Sensei, which is the AI platform there, will do that kind of thing there. Um, and Adobe Sensei is, is used across all of the Adobe ecosystem, even on the uh, you know Adobe stock, when you go look for photos and you say, hey, find me photos similar, visually similar to this one, you upload a photo, it shows you the similar one. This is all Adobe Sensei. So that's like out of the box AI stuff. And for most company, that would be sort of the, the low hanging fruit to get. Same thing for search results. So the search bar, the relevance for search bar was like always okay-ish or not that strong and in lots of e-commerce, Shopify, Magento, big commerce and so on. 
you would often replace the search bar with something else, a third-party system, Algolia or other. And now you have something a little bit better coming out that you have Adobe Sensei in the search bar uh, for the Adobe Commerce clients there that you have some level of AI in the search bar. So we're having some evolution there, but it's still very entry level. It's machine learning. We're really far from the, uh, the general uh, you know, AI there. Um, so, so it's step by step to get there. You can see AI projects going on. Um, even here, like government of Quebec is, is uh, giving huge grants and subsidies to AI project for it has to be approved by a board and so on, but they'll pay up to half of a bill, up to a million dollar to help AI project get developed in the province of Quebec here. So the government's pushing hard for this stuff. Um, but a lot of it is, is just groundwork. You see most companies have a hard time even with just implementing an ERP integration because they need to clean up their data, standardize their processes and so on. If you want to get to AI, you need to get all that stuff in perfect functioning order that is flawless. And then you can get to AI. It's like, the same kind of cleanup you need to do to do marketing automation that every step of your email process, onboarding process, client delivery process, and so on is automated. Then that would be the next level after it, after let's say having everything run on, on keep or active campaign or whatever, the next level would be AI helping you run that stuff. You know, speaking of AI, um, you know, as a business owner, CEO, what are some of the tools and software you use uh, with your, for your company? In general or for, for AI? Yeah. In general? In general. Well, we do have uh, Atlassian Jira and Confluence for like documenting and handling like project execution. We've built our own in-house sort of ERP CRM uh, thing that's called BusyDesk. Uh, it's all our ticketing system and so on. It's a very expensive route of, of building your own custom system and maintaining it. But for the part of the business that it does run, there are clear benefits because it's truly customized. Uh, other than that, for counting, would be like QuickBooks Online. Uh, there'll be the Office 365 suite in, in the Google uh, apps. Um, and then uh, what else? I mean, uh, what know, about communication with stuff. the teams? Uh, MS Team. MS Team. Uh, we'll use Zoom also for calls. Um, for sales calls, I prefer Zoom because it has a true full screen. When you're on Teams, you do a full screen share. It's not full screen. You have people in the sidebar and so on. So it like scales down your, your presentations. For sales, uh, definitely Zoom is better than MS Team at the moment until MS Team changes the true full screen support there. Um, MS Teams versus Slack? Just because you're on MS Teams all the time? Yeah, I mean, Slack's great. It's just like it's a paid thing and like, I didn't see the, I didn't want to bother paying one more thing. It's a personal preference. Uh, Slack, great. Slack's great. No problem there. So for the CRM, it's kind of acts as a CRM and a help desk at the same time? Uh, yeah, a busy desk that, that we have in house. We have also Active Campaign. We used to have uh, Infusion Soft Keep stuff, uh, got out of there. Uh, some friends call it the confusion stuff. So um, yeah, active campaigns that we use for the automation and for the onboarding process of clients and so on. Do you um, for do you use the pipeline version pipeline uh, features of active campaign or is that in the CRM? Um, no, we're not using it right now. That would be uh, separately right now for that part. So it's more, more using it to like automate step by step. A new client will send a welcome email, and then we send a follow up, and then book an appointment. Have you booked? If not, send a follow up. So it's more like uh, process automation yeah. for project execution. How else do you use Active Campaign? Maybe other companies, agencies should be thinking about. Uh, I'm not a big uh, expert in that field since uh, we're we're not too strong on the marketing side. We're actually like really, we, we do the design and the build and we're really like uh, an engineering firm at the mm -hmm. core. So Active Campaign, we use it to send normal newsletter like everybody would do. Um, and other than that, in but you internal use it processes. For the also. Yes, yeah, we use it because it's standardized stuff. So like if you want to scale up the agency at one point, even if some people will push back on it, you have no choice. You need to say, okay, there's not 10 ways of doing things anymore. Like there's one way for each cell channel. Like, where did I get this? Lead? Did I get it from my website? Is it an RFP request? Is it a, a referral? Is it from LinkedIn or whatever? And then 
what's the next step in the funnel, depending on where it came from in the execution of my process. And if it comes as an RFP and it comes with the 70 pages of requirements, it's a different flow for the sales process than if it's me who sourced that lead and they have no documentation whatsoever about their project needs and we need to write 50, 70 pages of stuff if we decide to go that route. So you, you need a one ideal client experience that is step-by-step step the whole thing. Then you'll have the detour because sometimes clients will not want to follow the path, but each detour needs to be documented. Uh, this company called Six Division is pretty awesome at that. They, they help me there uh, a lot. And then each client experience gets standardized. So if it's coming from the website, if it's coming from an RFP, if it's coming from this or that, and they have variation of the same client experience. One big step um, that you took is you hired a head of project management, essentially. Yeah. What yeah. were you looking for? And um, tell me about kind of that process. Okay. So, um, well, our company right now is sort of siloed into two. There's one side is like a support in many projects in a way. So we have a, a person there in charge and you know, doing a great job uh, and he takes care of the whole thing. So nothing comes to me as the entrepreneur and CEO when it's like small projects and, and customer requests and support. And if a customer in old contact just contacts me for some stuff, I just forward it to support and, and it's taken care of. So that there's that part, but then building new sites, especially that we're, we're building large complicated sites. We can be talking like a thousand hours to 5,000 hours per project. Some of those can be quite a headache. So that part of the company was not yet running with help me. So that's the transition by hiring like a head of PMO, a project management office. That's like production director of the whole new build, if you wish. My goal there is to completely remove myself from the delivery of all client process. I still want to be involved in the company in general, but um, I want to be completely out of deliveries. You know, What were you looking for in that person? Were you looking internal, external? How did you find them? Uh, I was part of a project management hiring process and sort of a, a bit of a surprise, I guess, that say, hey, okay, uh, I think I just found an amazing candidate. And uh, now we'll need that uh, feeling to, to see because it's a new hire. Well, we'll see to, if the person delivers, but I, I think so. Uh, so uh, great organizational skills, uh, but in, in a clear, practical way. So instead of me organizing everything as I used to, so somebody can come in and, and organize me almost the same way that my accountant or tax specialist can organize me. <laughs> it's like, okay, now we, we got some solid expertise of someone from operations. So if you're familiar with the EOS, entrepreneurial operating system, like, okay, so I'm on the visionary seat and I need somebody else that can sort of just take the pile of, of to-dos and, and make it happen and deliver on all that stuff for the project delivery and everything that we need to do to improve the delivery process of the company, basically. So it was really a project management. The person just stuck out and you saw them being able to shine as being in the help in a bigger fashion. Yeah. As, as head of all project managers, basically. Um, what should we, any of us listening, be thinking about as far as the hiring process? Well, that, that, that's one wide question. Um, for sure, the values, like uh, I used to think, oh, values, my company values, like it's a, it's cliche or whatever. But no, when we scaled up really quickly, the company, like we sort of grew a little too fast and we would compromise on some value or some value were not even written now clearly. And and then at the first list of value was way too long. And then it's hard to stream it line, streamline it down. And I'm also in that process myself right now to, to have a very, very short list instead of like eight to like three or four. And this is, must be truly universal across the whole company and no compromise is acceptable on this. So if the person doesn't meet those three or four checkbox for all position from HR to accounting to product development and deliveries, then it's just not a fit, you know? So to not compromise on, on values on the team that we're trying to build, take a little bit more time in the hiring, even though there's pressure, we need to, we want to increase our sales, we want to hit our numbers. We have a new client we want to sign, but to hire too fast, the wrong people, I've done it. Uh, and that's definitely a mistake. Uh, the, the number one thing to avoid. What's an example of a value? And I'd well, love to hear how it's kind of baked into the hiring process. Maybe it's something you ask. Maybe it's something you observe. What's an example of one of the values? 
Okay. Well, um, like I said, we, since we have such a long list of values, we're trying to regroup them, something like build future-proof quality solutions, for example. So this is one. And then we'll try to find specific examples of quality work that they're proud of their work, of strong work ethics. So like, I want to hear how they work. Like, you know, for example, when I was starting out as an employee before starting this company, I'd come in in normal time as everyone, but I'd be typically the last one out. Like at 11, I was closing the shop. At five or six, I was stopping to work for the business. But back then, I didn't have a powerful computer like the company could provide to me. That was like 2003 or whatever. Uh, so I would stay there to use the company's resources, and then I would work on my own stuff. And I'd go from like five or six to 11 p.m. and say, okay, now, now that's drive, a strong work ethics. And do you uh, pay attention? Do you care about the customer? Uh, you know, so deliver an, an awesome client experience is another value. And this will have all kinds of subsets, such as like honesty and integrity. And we want to define all that stuff. Somebody who builds great client relationship has clear communications and transparency, you know, so to be customer service oriented. So we'll try to identify or ask examples where they've delivered great customer service, if, if that's applicable and so on. So we'll be really probing questions to try to have uh, to see if it's a fit for that person. Another one for us is uh, resourcefulness, like figure it out and get it done. Um, we're a small company, so it's not we're not 400 people here. And we sometimes see that problem. If we hire from the 400 people company and they come here, it's sometimes an issue, you know, that uh, they just want to put the, a screw, a bolt in the hole all day long. And it's like, no, no, here you have to be able to do a lot, you know. I want to hear some resources and books that you like. I noticed that you are a certified scrum master. Uh, one of my favorite books is Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by J.J. Sutherland. Uh, yes. What sure. are some of your favorite books or resources? Oh, for sure. Uh, Scaling Up uh, by Vern Harnish. That's, uh, that's one by... I really love, uh, top of mind for me. Uh, everything from um, uh, for EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System, as we said. So like one's called Get a Grip on Your Business. So that's a, that's a really strong one. And uh, then I guess I have just like so many. I'd have to take a I've moment. I've had Gino to... Wickman on the podcast and uh, also Mark Winters, who wrote Rocket Fuel with it's Gino awesome. Wickman on the mm -hmm. podcast. But those are both great. I mean, uh, both great books and authors yes sure. agreed agreed built to sell because that can definitely help you to streamline a bit like i explained before it goes more in depth um john warlow yeah exactly yep. exactly uh, and the list is really long like uh, i'm trying to browse through the <laughs> the list here of stuff are you on audible? audible yeah exactly uh, listen to a lot of it uh, yeah, getting things done is good one. If if you want, um, I had that funny joke for a while. I started a book called Getting Things Done. I didn't finish it, you know, <laughs> and I uh, thought I was some kind of wise ass thing. That's but, David but, Allen, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then I listened to the audio version. It's amazing. Like the guy on audio is amazing, and it's like, oh man, I should have listened to that thing a few years ago. That that was that was still many years ago from now, but it, it was was a really good one. Um, yeah, I'll have to think a bit about it. But yeah, no, I, there, there are so many ones. Of them. All those are good ones. Um, the I want to you know talk about websites for a second because everyone has a website, and so I like to hear how you think about websites. And specifically, let's just start with if you're watching the video, um, ButcherBox, ButcherBox.ca. This one specifically um, was a migration from yeah, Shopify from, to Magento. Yeah, so exactly. why? My, you know, you pointed out a couple of reasons of why Magento and also why Shopify, why this one migration to Magento. Yeah, exactly. So this one, well, I've done both, by the way. I've done, I've seen people go from Magento to Shopify and vice versa. So the importance of picking the right platform from the start, or in their case, uh, it was probably a good idea to be on Shopify when they were a startup, but it just kept growing, uh, you know, and this NDA cannot say too much on the details there, but let's say that the millions were piling up in terms of top line revenue and eventually the they need more 
flexibility and power in terms of how they handle the day-to-day operation of the business. So what we've done here is far beyond just like, oh, uh, you just, uh, you know, create yourself a box uh, and choose this, um, which is all the fully custom buying process. If you go step-by-step to start building a box, um, because Magento out of, out of the box doesn't look like that at all, you know, it's this whole subscription model. Uh, so he basically turned it more or less into an ERP and the subscription model here has so many added features that it would be difficult to, to develop on a platform that is not open source and so flexible because he's pushing the boundaries really far for everything, customer options, internal operation, notifications, uh, and so on. I mean, look at these pictures. It's delicious. If you're in uh, the US, can you buy from here? Uh, you'd go to dot com, which is not my client, okay. but uh, yeah. It's, it's the same company? I think it's a franchise per country oh, or something. Got I'm not it. too okay. sure exactly. Okay. Because this looks amazing, actually. 100% grass fed, naturally raised meats and fish to your door. Sign me up. I think they just got another customer because of you, Guillaume. Um, so, any other things that we should just think about um, when we're thinking about our own website? Like, what are we looking at here and, and why is it designed the way it is? Okay, well, for sure, the it, it's step by step. So it depends where you are in the pyramids of need, so to speak. So the first step is you need a website and ideally make it transactional, even for a service company, sell a package, sell a retainer or something online if you can. You know, it's always fun to wake up with money in the morning, even for a service business. So, but we focus on product business, obviously. So the first step is just have it, have a website, be transactional, clean up your inventory standardize your system and have a lot of data for all of your products, like all the technical specification, PDF, lots of photos and so on. And what I've just said is sort of the table stakes now. It's the, it used to be, if you have an amazingly well-detailed catalog, you, you could stand out. You will still stand out a little bit, but it will just put you with with the, the leaders of the pack in a way, but it's also the, the table stakes. So if you look at some Amazon listing, I was showing this uh, a few days ago to a company, they're selling like in, in ad, their average like B2B order is like 150K. Like, yeah, but look how thin this is in content. Here's a $59 Amazon uh, product with three times more content and details and pictures than yours, you know? So <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, but again, that's just a table stake. Then you need the traffic. And you, you need to sort of evolve at each step of the growth of the site to evolve with it. So I had customers that, for example, reach over $100,000 a month and above in pay-per-click, but had some resistance, I guess, to exploring more SEO simply because they were burnt in the past or didn't clear, we see the value, whatever. But you have to evolve with each um, step that you step up. And when you have the traffic for it, the user experience optimization and you know conversion rate optimization, A, B testing, Lots of merchants don't do it that have a, a sufficient traffic of like uh, in the several tens of thousands per month and above who should be actually doing a, a multi-version testing. Now, do you help uh, maintain that for, for customers, clients after you develop the site? Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much the only services we offer. We build sites, we maintain site, and we'll offer general like consulting. And then for execution of marketing stuff, we'll refer uh, other partner agencies. Cool. Yeah, you can see on here. Um, the the next thing I want to talk about is is kind of clear step by step uh, on what people um, need to do uh, to get this. And I'm going to click on the view products because I'm hungry here. This looks good. Um, the next thing is clearbags.ca. Um, talk about what you did here. Okay. So this is the uh, Magento open source one. The other one is Magento commerce, uh, which is not called Adobe commerce. So this one uh, was a total revamp from a previous, uh, sort of homegrown platform. Uh, they've built very beautiful success over the years and was time to, to get more modern. Uh, it's already a few years old and I think it's aging well as a website. One key highlight for these guys, it was helping them uh, help improve their internal processes. So for example, how do you fulfill an order when you get an order? It may sound silly, but sometimes shaving off five minutes or three minutes per order processing 
if you have the volume for it, it makes a big impact. So in this case, with these guys, um, with the help, of course, of the owners uh, suggesting stuff and us suggesting stuff, they were able to cut off uh, three hours per day per employee. And they have five employees processing orders. So they, it's, it's a 15 hours per day of time saved mm-hmm. here in this case. So what we do is we would check like step by step. How do you process an order? Okay, it comes in. What's the status? Is it sent to your ERP? At which step is it sent to your ERP? Okay, now do you do you print a, a pickup list and you you go and you walk in the in warehouse? Okay, and how do you do that? Show us on the webcam and you know uh, then you you open this other software to prepare your your printing, uh, you know shipping label and so on. Okay, let's let's bridge that together and, and so on. So step by step to really automate all of this. The owner, of course, knew a lot of the opportunity that were there and, and needed someone to sort of give general counsel and to also implement that stuff. Some other things were suggested from us. So it's sort of a collaboration with smart owner there on, on how to streamline the whole process for technology. Most people don't think about, at least I don't, I don't think about that when it comes to a website and you're really walking through and how to make the process more efficient. And, you know, people are companies are used to doing it the way they always done it. And they're like, Oh, just, you know, I just need you to do the website, but you're thinking how did the website integrate into the whole business? It sounds exactly, like. exactly. And that, I guess that's something that I do enjoy, like, especially with the mid-sized companies and larger ones that's like, okay, how does it actually work? What's the process? A bit more of an engineering and process worldview on it than just, oh, let's make it pretty and let's rebrand or whatever. That's important too, but a lot of it comes down to, do you have enough traffic? Does that traffic convert? Is it relevant? Do you have proper product market fit? And then how efficient is your operation at handling all that volume, you know, to ship out the orders and so on. So that's what I'll focus on sort of, you could say it's a critical part of the business to optimize that a lot because you could waste a lot of your time just tweaking colors and whatnot. And even though I'm a former professional visual artist, may sound funny to say this, but very often there's a lot of time that's wasted um, by going overly zealous on design. Yeah. I was reading about your background. um, Some of which include, matte paintings for the discovery channel yeah and water butter and movie 300 and uh some for national banks and for Volkswagen. so yeah once upon a time it was a matte painter so it's to remove the green screen around actors or whatever a car or something and to put a fake background because obviously they, they didn't go to the moon to film uh, mars rising and they didn't mars no you disappointed i had no idea yeah. um <laughs> the i want to talk about how you think about partnerships right you mentioned that, you know, there's stuff that you do, you stay in your lane and there's, then you pass along to someone else who, you know, can kind of carry the torch on whatever other service that company needs. So what are some of the general types of partnerships you think of, whether it's uh, hosting or whatever, maybe we could talk yep. about some specifics. Yeah, for like uh, for businesses that have the volume, business intelligence do like to refer some partners for that. Uh, marketing for everything, pay per click management, uh, SEO, offsite SEO, link building, press release, and all that stuff. I refer an external mark, um, agency for that stuff. Uh, hosting, we do none of the hosting in house, uh, that two external partners. So they're just some key of it. And I do believe like even from an operational point of view and from a partnership point of view, like if you're clean and like you said, you stay in your lane, then you can partner. If you try to take over too wide, well, it's harder to partner. But also from an operations point of view, um, like when we started the agency, we were super wide. We had so many services. At one point, I remember looking at the Apple website, like maybe 12 years ago, whatever, say, hey, I have more services than Apple. You know, that that's than Apple has products. Like, okay, something's wrong here. So let's let's trim this list down and not offer everything from graphic design to we'll print your business card to uh, we'll do your IT support and we'll, we'll fix your printer and we'll do your website and we'll do your pay-per-click and your social media and your reputation management. Like, you can be a super wide agency, but you need hundreds of people to support that to the level that I see makes sense. You know? Yeah. You have to stay disciplined because I'm sure, you know, you're a trusted advisor. When you go in and you save them three hours per employee, they're like, Guillaume, what else can you do? You know? And they're like, we need SEO. We need pay-per-click. We trust you. 
How do you stay disciplined in that and decide we're not going to build out this service or you are going to build out this service? Maybe it's a slight offshoot of Magento development and something else is not. How do you think through that when you get requests? Well, there could be a question of volume. At one point, if you have enough volume for something and you have the interest for it, you might decide to add in one additional service. But again, stay clean in your lane and just add one additional service, not three, 10 of them, you know? So in our case, we do large projects, like a thousand, 5,000 hour of work typically per project. And that's for the new build. And then there's a whole support in the mini project division. So the volume is limited when each project is that huge. There's a limited number of, of new projects. So it's just super logical that starting new uh, you know, service offers like this is not necessarily, uh, at least in, in my way of viewing it, a, a super smart business move because you're just diluting your time and focus and resources. And then each time you add one surf, uh, service, you need to have more than one guy who can deliver it. You want redundancy. You know, he's on vacation, he's sick, whatever, he leaves. So you need to build that. Also, if you want to offer a super awesome client experience, you will have to document the whole user journey step by step to this new service and not just like start to wing it. At first you wing it to develop the process, but then you need to document it and standardize it. And as I tell my guys, I don't mind if you if you invent a new way, but we're going to document it. We're going to call it, you know, Michael's way or second second approach or second type or agile prototyping or whatever. And it's going to be documented, you know? I have one last question, which is kind of like a two-part question. Before I ask it, Guillaume, I want to point people to your website and uh, they can go to magemontreal.com to learn more. They can go more episodes of the podcast as well. Last question, um, which is kind of two parts, is when you're looking at, uh, ideal clients for you? How do you categorize that? And we'll talk about ideal staff because I know you uh, seem to be always hiring and looking for good people. So start with ideal clients. Who's an ideal client for you? Well, first of all, it would be a company that's that's driven to grow, that has the ambition to grow, and that has uh, well, the budget uh, of their ambition, of course, it goes with it. You know, so we'll typically be talking like six-figure builds uh, for for a new website, new projects, and so on. On the support side, it's much lower. Um, you know, it's just a prepaid time bank they can start and try the services, and if they like it, they could move to a retainer with a guaranteed availability and so on. Um, but it's it's really the the vision of the customer that I like to spend my time with someone that I believe we could make a big impact for them. And that if we work together for several years, then I'll have like a champion to talk about like some of these guys that we've taken from, let's say uh, almost nothing to like a low eight figure. And then I can show this and say, Oh, wow, you know, this is a flagship demo project. And then I can bring that client even on on a call with other potential clients or to an event and so on. So I want to be able to have that kind of impact for a few businesses that, that want to go far, basically, and that I'm going to spend my time at the right place there. Yeah. I mean, spending yeah. or saving three hours a day for an employee is pretty remarkable, even if it's for one day, let alone each day. Yeah, each day. And they, they, they five of them, you know, so that, that's pretty neat, definitely on this one. What about from a staff perspective? Well, staff, uh, you know, it's the value fit. I do believe in that to really hire, fire, reward, and review based on the values. And when we didn't do this, we had issues. And, and now we we do it, we believe in it, and we're really doing it, you know. So we want people who have that 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 commitment of continuous personal improvement, continuous improvement to strive for the mastery of their skills, and, you know, to cultivate world-class expertise, uh, to be coachable, uh, you know, that wants to build a great relationship or resourceful, uh, that will have strong professionalism, work ethics, and so on, that, that want to build, you know, uh, quality solutions, basically. Uh, so we're really looking for these things, and then we'll look after for, like, do you, how how well is the technical how good is the technical knowledge do they have certifications let's say on magento or not and so on everyone check out magemontreal.com check out more episodes of the podcast and obviously check out e-commerce wizards podcast as well guillaume thanks so much thank you jeremy for having me what i got you can't buy 
It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach if you find the sailor right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand